Hello everyone. We're going to pick up right where we left off, where Scotus is going to expand on Aristotle's distinction. Article 2. The distinction in itself. The difference between nature and will. As for the second article, we must investigate first the difference in itself and second what Aristotle meant. On the first topic, it is important to know that the fundamental distinction within active powers is on the basis of the different ways in which they elicit their activity. The fact that they act with respect to this or that object does distinguish powers in a way, or at least show that they are distinct, but it does not distinguish them as immediately as does the distinction in how they elicit their activity. For the relation of a power to the object with respect to which it operates is mediated by the activity that the power elicits in this way or that. So in other words, uh, Scotus is saying that it's not enough to distinguish powers by their objects, in other words, by what they do, what they act towards, but we have to distinguish them more fundamentally by what kind of power they are, how they elicit their effects, right? What they are, uh, how they are um, acting towards a particular end or towards a particular object. Uh, because that is the way in which they operate. It's more immediate to the power than the, the object of that power or the end that it's being pursued. Right? The means are closer to what the power is than the object pursued. All right, continuing on. Now, there can be only two different ways in which a power elicits its proper activity. Either one, it is itself determined to acting, such that as far as it depends on the power itself, it cannot not act when it is impeded by something extrinsic, or two, it is not determined of itself, but can do this act or an opposite act, and can also act or not act. The general term for the first sort of power is nature, and the second is called will. Hence, the fundamental division of active principles is into nature and will. In keeping with this, Aristotle in Physics 2 identifies two per accidents moving causes, chance, which pertains to nature, and fortune, which pertains to purpose or will. So this is the key, uh, this is the key distinction as Scotus describes it. This is the key distinction to this entire section, uh, and this is the his clearest statement of it. So I want to spend some time and go back over this and make sure that this is perfectly clear. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to just sort of breeze through this. So one, a natural power, a power uh, that is uh, part of nature, as he as he means it, uh, is determined to acting uh, by something outside of itself. Right, something else is determining what the power is going to do. Um, he also says that it cannot not act when it is not impeded by something. So it's always going to act to its full extent. Right? I've talked about this before, uh, both in the previous part of this, uh, this uh, reading group and also in my uh, lecture on the stomach principle. Uh, this is in fact the clearest uh, description of uh, what, what some of us have come to call the, uh, some of us scholars have come to call the stomach principle as, as uh, put forward by Scotus, that there's two kinds of things, stomachs and wills. The reason we use that, uh, that, that name for it uh, is that the stomach is, or the digestive system, the digestive powers, uh, are a prototypical example of a natural power that we human beings have. Uh, your, uh, your digestion, your, the process of digestion, the thing that your stomach is doing, is determined to acting. Right? In other words, it's just going to do, it's, it, it's going to do its thing. It's going to actualize itself fully uh, whenever it is capable of doing so. It's determined to act by the functioning of our bodies and by the food that we take in voluntarily. And so if we eat food, if we take in food, our stomach, if it's working properly, is going to digest it. Um, unless it is impeded by something outside of itself, like uh, disease or sickness or something, or, or, uh, or even you know, death, that kind of thing. That would impede the natural power from acting but as long as it's capable of doing so, it's not being stopped by something, it's going to just do what it does. It's going to always actualize itself to the maximum extent possible. You can't choose to only partially digest your food once you've eaten it, right? It's just going to happen, right? The power is constantly going to act to its full extent possible. This is contrasted with a rational power like the will, which is not determined by something else 
but determines itself. Right? It uh, it decides. Right? A rational power can either act uh, towards opposite acts. Right? So it can do this or that thing. It can uh, it can you know you can decide to uh, eat cake or eat pie uh, if we're sticking with the uh, stomach metaphor. Uh, but you can also choose to eat or not eat. Right? Uh, the choice to eat, right, something which is part of the, the action of the will, uh, is, is this sort of thing. It can do one way or the, it can go one way or the other, uh, and it is do, not determined, fully determined at least, by anything outside of itself, because that would make it a natural power. It would make it nature rather than will. It would make it an irrational power. Okay, so moving on, uh, let's continue with what Scotus has to say. Now, if one were to ask what causes this distinction, why that is nature is only of one, that is of itself is determinately a power for whatever effect or effects it is a power for, whereas will is of opposites, that is of itself, it is indeterminately a power for this action or its opposite, or for action or non-action. The right answer is that there is no cause. For just as an immediate effect is related to its immediate cause per se, and primarily and without any intermediate cause, since otherwise there would be an infinite regress, so too an active cause is evidently related in the most immediate way possible to its own action insofar as it elicits that action. Nor are we to assign any cause of why it elicits in this way other than simply that it is that kind of cause, which is the very thing whose cause this question is asking about. Therefore, just as what is hot heats because it is hot, the proposition what is hot heats is not immediate, but instead is, the, is a primary proposition that is per se in the fourth mode, so too is the proposition what is hot heats determinately of itself. And the same goes for the will wills, and the will does not of itself will determinately by a necessary determination. I'm not going to go into specifics uh, in my explanation here, uh, talking about the, the fourth mode. This is this has to do with, um, with Aristotle's analytics. Um, that's, that is technical terminology that's not too necessary here. Uh, what he's saying here is that this is what we would call an analytic truth. Uh, what we in sort of modern contemporary philosophy would call an analytic truth. Um, it is necessarily true. Uh, it is self-evident by uh, what by what is being said. Right there, there's there. It it is only uh, it isn't. It's a tautology. Right. I put it simply. So he uses these examples just to show that. Uh, these are uh, true by definition. There is nothing about either of these statements, whether what is hot heats or the will wills, uh, and understanding those naturally and uh, and rationally, respectively, um, that there's nothing about that that requires any further explanation. Right? Uh, as he, say, as he states so bluntly, uh, he says the right answer is that there is no cause. Right? So there is no cause of why, why is it that the will chooses this or that? Well, that's the wrong kind of question, so long as you're talking about efficient causes. right? So there is no determining cause as to why the will wills what it wills. Um, don't worry, the repetition of the word will be because of how English works is going to get even more annoying than it already is, but that's another page or two. Um, further, uh, the other, we also have to ask, well, uh, he also wants to ask, why is it that there are these two different kinds of things, right? Is there a cause for this difference? Is there a reason why the will acts one way and nature acts another? And he also wants to say, no, there's no particular reason for this. There's just two different sorts of things, right? Uh, both have their effects caused in the way that they cause them. Uh, they have this immediate cause. Um, and, it, and he says, right, they, they're in the most immediate way possible that leads to an effect, right? 
Um, but that one of them is determined by antecedent causes, right? Nature, nature is determined by antecedent causes, whereas will is not. It, it determines itself, and that's all there is to it. Uh, Scotus likes doing this. Um, he will, when confronted with a difficult question, uh, he will very often just simply say, shut up, that's a bad question. Uh, because on his model, this is really a, a malformed question. There is no reason for the difference, and there is no reason for the will's choice in the determinate sense. Now, one caveat that I want to add here. The will is always choosing for the sake of something. Right? Scotus isn't going to make it isn't here to make the will arbitrary. Uh, the will still does pursue ends, right? So it's acting for the sake of ends. Right? So if you ask, why did you choose cake rather than pie right? you can answer that in one of several ways right you can answer that as if they're asking okay what caused you to choose that what made you make that choice in which case you can answer oh, nothing did nothing made me choose cake over pie i just wanted cake more than i wanted pie and so i chose it however you could also start describing the things that you prefer about cake to pie and that is a perfectly reasonable way of answering the question. Right? That is talking it in terms of final causes rather than efficient causes. Right? Um, right? That would explain the reasons for your decision, but that's in a different sense. That's in the sense of, well, what is it that the will chose to pursue, not what caused the will to choose one over the other? Right? Because you could give just as coherent explanations for choosing the other, right? So if I say I chose cake over pie uh, because I really like my uh, my sweet desserts to have uh, to be fluffy and have frosting, right? I could, by contrast, say that well, I really prefer my uh, my sweet desserts to be hot with whipped cream, uh, and you're offering me an apple pie. Right? Both of those could be true, right? I could really like fluffy and frosted desserts, and I could really like hot desserts with whipped cream. It, there's, nothing, there's nothing contradictory about those things. The will simply chooses between them and sort of ex post facto says, these are the things that I am pursuing with this choice rather than the other choice. All right, so let's move on. Article 2, the distinction in itself continued. To this, one might object, first, the proposition a will wills is contingent. If the will is not of itself determined to willing, is how any how is any contingent proposition to the effect that it wills immediate? And second, why is this indeterminacy posited in the will if it can't be proved on the basis of the nature of the will? Uh, I want to make one clarification here. Um, because some of uh, some of Scotus's arguments, especially those involving contingency, uh, are a bit strange here, uh, especially strange in the context of other scholastics who talk about contingency. Uh, Scotus is primarily credited uh, with uh, some of the earliest use uh, and possibly even the invention uh, of modal logic, uh, which is the logic of possibility and necessity. So when he's talking about contingency here in this context, uh, he is talking about uh, that something could be otherwise, right? there, that it did not need to be the way that it is. It could have been other than how it is. Right? He's not talking about contingency in the sense that it relies upon something else, right? because uh, what he calls contingent propositions, uh, some of what he calls contingent propositions in some of the further in some of the later arguments that we will get to it's important to note that he means something very specific here he means contingent in the modal sense in other words that contingent means they could be otherwise uh, because some of the contingent uh, contingent truths that he's talking about have no antecedent cause right they are not reliant upon anything antecedent to themselves right so they would be non-contingent uh, in the other sense, in the sense that's more familiar to someone like Aquinas. 
So I want to make sure that this distinction is clear in our minds, that he's talking about contingency in terms of modality rather than contingency in terms of reliance, uh, reliance upon something more fundamental. All right, so continuing on, reply to the first objection. A contingent truth does not follow from necessary truths, obviously. So take some contingent truth. If it is immediate, my point is made. If not, set forth the intermediate. At least one premise that supports it will be contingent. Otherwise, a contingent truth would be inferred from only necessary truths. Now, if that contingent truth, uh, that contingent premise is itself immediate, one premise that supports it will be contingent. And thus, there will be an infinite regress unless it terminates in some immediate contingent truth. Okay, uh, once again, this kind of illustrates what I was saying. Uh, so he says to, to, so a contingent, why he says this is obvious, right? A contingent truth did not follow from necessary truths, obviously. Um, this should not be obvious if we are more familiar with, uh, say, the Thomistic understanding, uh, the earlier scholastic understanding of contingent versus necessary truths. Um, it's also worth noting that the, uh, that earlier scholastics are more prone to speaking about uh, contingent and necessary things rather than truths, right? Because again, Scotus is talking in terms of sort of early primitive modal logic here. He's talking about contingent propositions, truths, things that could be otherwise, truths that are true but could be false, right? They could have been false, maybe we should say. So a contingent truth does not follow from a necessary truth, obviously. This is very different from a contingent thing relying upon a necessary thing. Right? Uh, we can contrast this, for example, with, uh, with Aquinas' argument for, uh, for a necessary being, for God. Right? Aquinas posit, uh, points out that if we have contingent beings relying on other contingent beings, uh, we can't have an infinite regress there, so it has to bottom out in some necessary being. However, Scotus is pointing out that the opposite is true for contingent truths. A necessary truth has to rely on some prior necessary truth. There has to be something before it that is necessarily true that, that makes it necessarily true. A contingent truth can be immediate. In other words, it can just be the way it is. Right? It, it doesn't need to be... Um, it doesn't need to logically follow, which is different from being caused by, but it does not need to be to logically follow from some antecedent contingent truth. It could be the way that it is because it was just caused to be that way. And that's all there is to it. Right? Whereas a necessary truth, it needs to reduce back down to some further necessary truths. Right? So if it's not immediate, right? if it is a immediate uh, contingent truth. In other words, if the contingent truth is uh, is uh, made true, if it follows from something prior to it, then something that supports it is either contingent or something that supports one of those premises has to be contingent. The reason for this is that otherwise, if you have purely necessary truths, you don't get contingency anywhere. An example of this, because he doesn't really use examples here, unfortunately, um, is mathematics, right? If you have a, uh, okay, well, let's actually, let's simplify. Arithmetic mathematics, let's not get into statistics or probability theory because then it gets complicated. Uh, so let's just talk about arithmetic. Uh, if you have a complex series of math problems and math questions, one leading to another, propositions that lead from one to the next, at no point because mathematic, math, math, mathematics works necessarily, the truths work necessarily, at no point are you going to get indeterminacy in your answers, right? The answer is always going to be determinate and it's going to be determined by the prior answers. In order for there to be a contingent truth, there has to be something contingent before it, right? If there, it, the contingency has to come from somewhere, not just from uh, the necessary antecedents, right? 
So if your answer to a math problem is contingent, the only thing it could be contingent upon is some decision that was made. For example, what was the origin of, uh, of the math problems, right? Why did you pick the initial values? Well, that could be contingent. I made the, I picked the initial values for the sake of putting them onto the test, not for the sake of anything that's, you know, necessarily true about a, um, uh, about any kind of, uh, like an axiom or anything like that. So hopefully that, that analogy might clarify what he means here, because again, this is, this is, um, perhaps counterintuitive or perhaps this is just very intuitive, but it's certainly, uh, the opposite way of considering contingency and necessity, uh, from when you're considering contingent things and necessary things, um, especially, uh, in sort of the Thomistic sense. Sorry, let's continue where he, uh, continues to, uh, to cite Aristotle on the matter. Confirmation in posterior analytics one. Aristotle holds that there can be belief propter quid, that is, on the basis of immediate propositions, and belief quia, on the basis of mediate propositions. Thus, in the present case, take the will wills A. If there is no cause between the extremes, my point is made. If there is a cause, say, the will wills B, one must go further, but one must come to a stop somewhere. Where? Why does the will will that? At the point at which one comes to a stop, there will be no cause other than that the will is the will. And yet, if that last proposition were necessary, it would not be the only antecedent for a contingent proposition. So if the will wills A, right, the will makes a choice. Uh, if there isn't a cause, right, if there isn't something that made the will make the choice, uh, then you're done, right? You have the will making a choice, and that is an, a, uh, the beginning of a new causal sequence with a contingent choice, a choice that could go, could have in principle gone either way, a free choice ultimately. However, you could say, well, the will wills A because the will wills B, right? Uh, maybe I can say the will wills to skip dessert because the will wills a diet. Okay, great. But then you, have, you can take it a step further and say, well, why does the will will a diet? Uh, and because the will wills a diet, it's necessarily going to will to skip dessert, right? That's, that's determinate. But then we're just going back a step and we're saying, well, why did the will choose to have a diet, go to, to go on a diet? Then we can say, well, I wanted to, I wanted to lose weight, right? That is, we can say, uh, we can stop there and we can say that's contingent because I chose to lose weight. Right? Uh, now, maybe we can go further and we can say, well, I, I chose to lose weight because of medical necessity. Right? Fine. But then the will is choosing a certain course of action and right? a certain course of action that we anticipate will lead to uh, good health results. Right? Or even we can say that we're we are choosing to uh, we're choosing to sacrifice pleasure for the sake of health, right? In which case both of those are intrinsic goods, so it's not like one of them is necessarily going to be the object of will, and the other one is necessarily not going to be, and so we have a contingent choice. All right, uh, wrapping up with the uh, second reply. In reply to the second objection, it is proved a posteriori. For someone who wills experiences that he is able not to will or to will against, as I have explained in discussing the freedom of the will at greater length elsewhere. Uh, this is a really interesting and useful distinction. Uh, and I have another video that's related to it that you'll find in the description. Um, so this is a, a great way, I think, of, uh, of proving how the will or in general, how an aspect of the self or an aspect of the mind works by introspection, right? Uh, we find that when we will, we will freely, because of course we do, <laughs> right? Um, we, this should be uh, patently obvious to anyone who makes a choice ever, that our wills are fundamentally indetermined, undetermined in a, in a uh, at least in the, uh, the ordinary sense. Uh, so this is his this is his kind of uh, his most direct way of proving a point, uh, which is to just point out, well, look at how you actually make a choice. 
ta-da, we've made our, we've proven it. All right, so let's uh, continue on. Second, what I said above raises a question. How is such a cause reduced to act if it is indeterminate to, of itself to acting and not acting? I answer, there is an indeterminacy of insufficiency, which comes from potentiality and a lack of actuality. This is the way in which matter does not have a form is indeterminate with respect to carrying out the action of that form. There is another indeterminacy of superabundant sufficiency, which comes from unlimitedness of actuality, whether unqualifiedly or in a certain respect. Something that is indeterminate in the first way is not reduced to act unless it is first determined to a form by something else. Something that is determinate in the second way can can, uh, can determine itself. For it could, if it could do this, if it had a limited act, how much more could it do so if it had an unlimited act? Since then it would lack nothing that was unqualifiedly a principle of acting. Otherwise, God, who is supremely undetermined with the, inter with the indeterminacy of unlimitedness to any action, could not do anything, which is false. And I'm going to stop before he goes to his examples and try and explain exactly what he's saying here in, uh, in abstract principle. Uh, so first of all, uh, he's trying to make a distinction between two ways that something can be indeterminate, two ways that contingency can pop up, right? two ways that we can say, well, we don't know how something is going to turn out. Um, so um, one is the indeterminacy of insufficiency. Uh, this is what we would call underdetermined in the sort of modern philosophical language, uh, the contemporary philosophical language, in, uh, that something is underdetermined uh, because there has not been a sufficient cause to determine something to action. Right. He uses the example of matter which does not have a form, right, is not determined toward any particular end. Uh, and we can, of course, uh, we can say, we can, we can talk about um, I think he's implying prime matter here, so matter which has no form whatsoever, but we can also talk about underdeveloped or, in, or undeveloped form. Um, so something which is not yet completed, um, right, something which is indeterminate because it is um, in a sense immature, um, or is just simply is, uh, has not completed its action yet. Right? If we haven't gotten to the terminus of our action because we have acted insufficiently, then we haven't determined the end of that action. Right? You haven't made the decision about whether to turn left or right at the fork of the road if you haven't gotten to and cannot get to the fork in the road. Right? So this is what indeterminacy of insufficiency is. Something is indetermined, uh, indeterminate, right? It, it could go either it, it it isn't necessarily going to go one way or the other because it doesn't have the power of itself to act one way or the other. In, a, in other words, the only way that it's going to do anything is if something pushes it into that way. The other way that he talks about is the indeterminacy of superabundant sufficiency, which means that something ha is, uh, to use the modern term, overdetermined. Um, although that's not quite precise in terms of overdetermined, um, overdetermined in the modern sense. Um, it's analogous, but it's, it's, there's disanalogies, but we'll, we will set that aside unless that comes up in, in discussions, but feel free to, feel free to discuss that if you're interested. Uh, in any case, the indeterminacy of superabundant sufficiency, uh, he says comes from an unlimitedness of actuality, uh, meaning that we have, uh, in this case, we are capable of choose. Uh, we're capable of doing action A, and capable of doing action B, not just one or the other, right? but we are fully capable of doing both. 
right? I say we here because we are rational creatures and, and the will is a rational power in, in the sense that we're talking about here. So we have what's called superabundant sufficiency. We can, uh, we are fully capable of choosing A or f and also fully capable of choosing B. Um, we have more actuality rather than less. Uh, it's not like we are in, uh, we're indetermined. Uh, we're indeterminate because uh, we uh, we can't act one way or the other. Rather, we're in uh, we are indeterminate because we could act either way. And we're fully capable of acting one way or the other. Okay. Uh, his example of God uh, as being supremely undetermined because of God's superabundant sufficiency. Um, is a kind of reductio ad absurdum, right? He says, well, if God were undetermined because he were limited, he were potential and lacked actuality, well, that's that's absurd, right? No, God is pure act, uh, is pure actuality, has no potentiality, and is uh, sufficiently capable of doing anything, of doing any action uh, in an under in an undetermined way right god's choice leads to action right so this is analogizing us uh, us human beings uh, in a sense to god's uh pure actuality now this is a limited analogy we are not uh we are not pure actuality obviously but we are, uh, we are, as he says, super abundantly sufficient. We have more actuality than we need to act in a natural or, or necessary or deterministic sort of way. Right? We have the kind of actuality, the kind of super abundant actuality, if you will, um, to act in the manner or in a manner similar to how God acts when God creates. Because we are capable of uh, of acting, we're fully capable of acting one way or another in, in multiple different ways. Uh, and so we are undetermined, we're not determined by anything outside of us. And so we're capable of making a choice. Uh, and in that sense, uh, there's, I have another video coming out on this same subject that I will have sometime during this, uh, during this uh, reading group series. Um, on what the implications this on what implications this in particular has uh, towards uh, Scotus's idea of what the imago dei is or the image and likeness of God that we uh, that we bear. All right, so let's continue and look at his example. Here is an example of this: fire causes heat, and there is no question of something extrinsic by which it is determined to acting. If it were then given the perfection of cold without losing any of the perfection of heat, why could it not be determined by itself to heating just as, just as before? Granted, this example is not a perfect analogy as I will explain in replying to the preliminary argument. Now the indeterminacy that is ascribed to the will is not the indeterminacy of matter or of imperfection insofar as the will is itself active. Rather, it is the indeterminacy of exceptional perfection and of a power that is not bound to a determinate act. So uh, this is, I think, a very useful example. So a fire, which has the perfection of heat, and right? it's capable of causing heat um, because it is actually hot in the fullest sense. Um, suppose fire were given the perfection of cold. Now we have to be very careful about what that means. Uh, we don't want to say that the, the fire is actually both hot and cold at the same time in the same respect, because that would be an explicit contradiction. And as we looked at earlier, even with a rational power, even with something which is indeterminate in this way, it cannot be a contradiction. It cannot be uh, opposite things at the same time in the same respect. So we would have to say that, okay, well, if fire uh, has the perfection of heat and we're given the perfection of cold, right, it would have that perfection, what we call, uh, or what uh, the scholastics in general call, virtually. 
right? which is talking about rather than having it in, in full actuality, rather has it in the, uh, the capacity to produce it. Right. Um, so I like to use the example of language speaking when I'm talking like this, when I'm talking about this, right? I have the, uh, the, the full, I am fully actualizing my capacity to speak English, right? I am in fact speaking English, just like the fire is producing heat. But if the fire were given the perfection of cold, that would be like, uh, like teaching me the Spanish language. I happen to know the Spanish language decently, um, not perfectly, but well enough to the extent that I could speak Spanish. I am capable of producing sentences in Spanish. I have the perfection, perfection again being a, being maybe an overstatement, uh, but the perfection of the Spanish language. And so if I'm capable of producing Spanish, I have the perfection of Spanish. I have this, this virtual actuality. So fire here has the capacity under the under his example, right? Fire has both the uh, the power to produce heat and the power to produce cold. If it has both of these, and since both of them cannot act in this at the same time because they're opposites, they're contraries, the fire can still continue determining itself to produce heat. Produce heat. The fire can keep heating. Or because the fire would then be capable of doing both, the fire could then instead produce cold. And what that would be doing is essentially giving the fire the indeterminacy or the power of superabundant sufficiency, meaning that the fire could essentially choose to do one of either uh, one of either opposites in this case. All right. Uh, that's about all the time we have this time, uh, so we will pick this up uh, in the next video. Uh, please um, come into the, the comments here uh, or on the Facebook page and have any discussions that you'd like, and feel free to stop by my live streams and, have any, uh, and ask any questions you have there. Uh, until next time.